Stop laughing, stop it. So I was just telling, can you see me, Tracy? I can. Yep. So I was just telling everyone that the woman between us and our drinks today is named Tracy Evans. No pressure here. Um, as the uh, as the week and the event developed, um, a slot came free, and the organizers asked um, if if we had anything else that we could contribute. I'd already been planning on showing you what I showed you this morning, um, and I. Um, Tracy was supposed to be here, but we were practicing um, operational risk mitigation by <clears throat> sending me to be quarantined with the fish and chips, and uh, she can stay home in the comfort of her lovely home. And um, <clears throat> so here I am. Tracy said, yes, she did have an idea, and um, just give me a moment to think about it. And she's actually come up with a completely brand new presentation that I have never seen before. This is the an absolute premiere, and she's done it especially for this event, so I think that's pretty exciting, and she's done it in the last two days, so thank you for that, Tracy. And um, I showed you some really practical aspects of how we approach uh, building strategically relevant, accurate, compelling communication, um, and how you can um, use the same thinking to do it yourself. Uh, Tracy is going to talk about uh, the other side of how we got to working like we do, um, um, is, which is um, we have pretty, pretty strong feelings about culture and about ethics and about um, sort of feeding into clarity from a perspective, a perspective of honesty and transparency. So, um, Tracy, I'm going to let you take it away. You have um, up to 45 minutes if you need it. Um, okay. So, everyone, my business partner and... Uh, the other partner at Open Strategy Partners, Tracy Evans. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name's Tracy, um, and uh, you all know my, my business partner, Jam. Um, we founded Open Strategy Partners about two and a half years ago uh, together, and, um, Sorry, patience while I learn how to navigate to two systems here. Um, so we founded OSP about two and a half years ago, and, and OSP was born out of some conversations and strong ideas about communication, uh, which has now become our communication model, which underpins essentially everything that we do. And it's called authentic communication, and it's based on the three elements that you see on the screen, empathy, clarity, and trust. And so naturally, I gravitate towards any material, any books, any blog posts, any videos uh, written on any of these three topics. And when I was at home over Christmas, I came across a book um, that ended up inspiring this talk. And that book um, was written by Canada's former Gover Governor General, uh, David Johnston, and it's called uh, Trust. 20 Ways to Build a Better Country, um, and in this book he implores us to see that trust is actually gained through our actions and decisions, on our doing and not merely saying, on the basis um, that can be observed and measured rationally, to quote the book. Um, and he wants us to basically explore the different attitudes, habits, and approaches that make people businesses, organizations, and countries uh, trustworthy. And so in this talk, I'd like to actually share with you 10 practical tips to mindfully build trust into your communications. And I'd like to make the argument that if we put actions like these at the core of how we communicate, we can better build, uh, we can build better connections, better businesses, and better communities. <clears throat> So, why does trust matter? Well, um, these days, there's been, especially in the last couple of years, there's a trend towards more and more people making values-based decisions, um, including and especially around things like where they work, where they contribute their time and their effort and their money, and uh, definitely to what tools and services they use or support. Um, and when I was doing a little reading and a little research on the subject, um, you know, you might have in mind that this is just really 
um, pertaining only to, to, to millennials and younger generation. Um, but the research shows that this is increasing um, across all generations, that people are making more values-based uh, decisions in, in everything that they do and everything that they contribute to. Um, and while you know, there's a lot of um, easy examples that might come to mind where people make uh, values-based decisions uh, based on their on their moral values. Um, I'd like to give you. I'd like to share an example um, of one um, that you know uh, that is close to, to uh, an example from our work that, that is based on business values rather than than just um, moral values. And um, the example that I thought of for us is um, our use of the project management tool Asana. Basically, um, you know, Asana evokes a lot of trust for me and for my team members. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I trust the operations of my company, so the operational health of my company in Asana. And um, what the, the design and the user experience um, that they've put into their product invokes the trust that they've designed for a smooth workflow that I and my team will feel comfortable and engaged using it. Um, unlike for me, uh, just for a minute, unlike Jira, which um, feels, looks, and acts very clunky to me. Um, and so that gets in the way of um, me engaging with it and using it, which um, is a core part of the, the value of the tool. Um, and on in another aspect, the, the training materials and the content that Asana puts out there not only enables me to do better project management, but because I have a really a very full view of their knowledge and best practices on project management, I can see and trust um, that they align with my ideas of project management, and I can trust that they've built that into the UX of their product. So. Um, that being said, and that example being shared, um, I'd like to argue that trust is one of the most important or always underlying values that influences people's choice. Um, and for people to engage with your company, your, your project, or your product, they need to connect with you. And to do that, they need trust. Um, so when we ask ourselves, you know, what, what is trust? Um, the, the very basic Oxford English Dictionary definition is that it's a firm belief in the reliability, truth, or ability of someone or something. Um, but it's actually a lot more complex than that. And um, trust is one of those things that's often overlooked. But it's an extremely important uh, phenomenon, and it's one that's worth deeper consideration. Um, in your strategic thinking and when you're building all of your communications. Um, and uh, one of the models that I really like um, that talks about trust, I looked at a few different ones, and there's some great ones out there in terms of trust in, in personal relationships. Um, but in terms of trust in the business sphere, sphere I really like to see Covey's trust model. Um, I think that you can really, I think you can easily see how this might come across in um, in everything that you communicate and everything, um, all of the the assets and the and the touch points that you have as an organization that you put out there. Um, I think that you could probably take a look at this and see how this um, how this really resonates. Um, and I like how he's broken it down into uh, both character and competence, and I think that um, these things are uh, are equally important um, in terms of the way that um, people either um, consciously or unconsciously um, build trust with your with your brand. Um, you know, for example, that Asana example I had never thought about until today, until I needed to think of an example uh, for this presentation. It's not something that I've consciously thought about, um, but the transparency that they have with things like their pricing model, or transparency around um, and sharing of their their best their project management best practices um, is definitely something that unconsciously uh, played played an impact. Um, 
impacted my, my view of them. Um, and so I think we come back to when we're when we think about trust, um, the things that go might go through our mind are, are things like, you know, can you actually can you solve my problem and can you solve solve it better than any of the alternatives? And this um, goes to everything that's there on our capabilities. Um, and for me, I definitely, when I look at um, any technologies that we use as an organization, I want to see that their business model is fair, transparent, and competitive. Um, so there's a number of software companies out there that choose not to list their pricing, for example, and it always gives me a very negative feeling, um, and I assume that it's going to be outrageous, um, and I would rather see that they give me a starting point um, and that it's transparent, that I, knew, I know that I'm getting the same kind of pricing um, as, the rest of the, as the rest of the market. Um, and the third question um, that I think that people tend to ask themselves are, um, do the organization's values align with mine? Um, moral values, business values, and technical values, you know, which practices that you're using and, and things like that. So this is the, the, I thought that this model was really helpful to frame uh, our thinking. And I want to talk about um, just a couple, I just wanted to sort of paint a picture of the different domains where we really need to think about trust and um, the, so for me, there's definitely different cues and different um, different hints that you see in um, definitely in the support and interaction. You know how accessible you are via Slack or um, the way that you interact with your clients. Um, your training, how available is, how how well it's done, um, and uh, technical documentation. There's a lot of various cues in there. Um, but the two that I really want to focus on today are your product communications and um, editorial communications. So product being things like product pages on your website, data sheets, demo presentations, and, and that sort of material. And um, your editorial communication being things like blogs, PR, social, and things like that. So those are the two um, that I'd like to, to focus on and start sharing um, my 10 ways uh, to build more trust. So the first one um, that I want to talk about is being technically accurate always. Um, this was uh, one of the very first conversations I think that I had with Jim about um, his ideas around authentic communication and how important it is to be technically accurate in everything that we do um, and the way that, for example, the way that we go about doing that is to interview the experts, to interview the technical person who knows um, who knows the topic and to get that information verified and that's something that um, even if you're applying these internally for yourself, um, this is where you can encourage your marketing team or your marketing person to make sure that they're interviewing or sitting down or having their work reviewed with a technical expert. And um, on the other side, encouraging your technical experts to contribute their time um, and really connect with the marketing team and support them to make sure that your materials um, go out there with technical accuracy. So this is probably, it's number one in the list um, and, probably, and probably one of the most important um, Tips. The second way um, is to to be precise in your language um, and uh, absolutely avoid uh, hyperbole at all costs um, in the clients and um, companies that we work for work um, with. They're often their target their audience is developers and developers are especially be allergic um, to hype and buzzwords and hyperbole and um, a good practice um, that actually makes for better communication um, is just to be more precise in the language that you're using. 
<clears throat> way number three is uh, to have tight writing. So making sure that all of the writing that you do is crisp and sharp and focused, um, making sure that it is clutter free and that it doesn't have any extraneous words or sentences or uh, paragraphs. And this is something that for me, um, for myself as a non-technical um, consumer of te technical information, whether I'm thinking about using a piece of software or engaging with some of our clients, um, I get lost very fast when there's extraneous information. Um, some of the topics are difficult enough to track on their own, and so to keep it um, crisp and sharp and only include the essential information um, to make your point um, means that it's going to resonate that much stronger with your audience. Um, and this is one that I feel personally very strongly about um, when I'm consuming technical information. Point number four um, is uh, to have a clear narrative structure. Uh, this one is similar to the tight writing principle, and it's something that, um, that I also feel really strongly about when I'm reading, uh, especially blog posts. Uh, this applies particularly well to, to blog posts. If there is no clear narrative structure, um, it has a similar impact to the extraneous information. I just get lost, um, and you know some of these technical topics are difficult to deal with on their own. Um, that um, that if you if you don't have a clear narrative structure, um, it can be really difficult for your for your audience to follow and um, uh, and actually helps to uh, make the point that you're trying to get across. Point number five, um, similar uh, uh, to the last point, um, you need an easy to navigate informational structure. Um, so this is keeping uh, the number of pages and the flow of pages on your website um, easy to navigate and easy to understand where people need to go to find information. Um, it also pertains to things like ebooks or any other longer material um, to make sure that that's that it's really easy to navigate um, the information. Uh, point number six is a strong logical rigor, and definitely be wary of those logical fallacies. Um, we. Uh, have created something that we use internally so far and have shared with a couple of clients um, called our Writer's Guide, and we've created an additional special chapter um, just on this topic of logical rigor um, because it's something that I think is, um, it can be quite challenging or easy to fall into certain traps, and um, it's uh, it's one of the most important points to keep your uh, to keep things clear. Hey Tracy, and, yeah. I was um, I was telling people about our intention to sh um, share even more of what we do, and so I'm just going to jump in here for one second. We're um, we're in the middle of relaunching our website, and um, we haven't figured out the exact style yet. We think maybe like the GitLab company handbook. Um, these writers' guides and these principles and stuff, we've documented an awful lot of it so that we can onboard new writers and new team members, and um, we are going to have that all available online in the reasonably near future. Depends on, like, especially if somebody's clamoring for it, um, that would really help me get it out faster, but we, we, um, we consider this uh, something else that, that will be really important and, and, and good to share and enable other people to, like, help us do it better, but also just communicate better in general. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, and um, I've got here in my notes. I wanted to share a couple of the examples from our writer's guide um, of some of the logical fallacies that uh, that we can easily fall into. And the first one is um, overgeneralization. And 
that's where the writer bases the argument on insufficient evidence, um, where the writer draws a larger conclusion than what the evidence supports. So, for example, um, if you're claiming that Drupal is a better CMS, um, you've actually got to do a fairly exhaustive comparison with uh, very objective standards and unbiased results to be able to make that claim. Um, and uh, you know, and you'd have to like share your whole process with the reader and be fully transparent about that um, if you wanted to make a claim like that. Um, what would be better is if you shared um, the specific use cases where Drupal was the better CMS and the better choice for for um, you, right? For you, yeah, exactly. Um, and so that's one example. Um, another example that I that I kind of like is the non sequitur, um, where it doesn't follow, and that's where the writer's conclusion is not necessarily a logical result of the facts. So, for example, stating that um, because uh, Drupal has more functions, um, that it's a better CMS um, than, uh, than WordPress. Um, but obviously, more does not equal better, that, that isn't logical. Um, and so that's a trap um, that I'm sure we can come up with a better example uh, <laughs> um, for. But anyways, those are two, uh, two examples to share for this particular point. Moving on to point number seven. Um, <clears throat> um, this one's a little bit similar, but I think worth uh, drawing out on its own, um, make mindful claims, uh, so avoid binary claims, things like good or bad, or absolute claims, which is like the like best or worst, um, and actually, you know, just respect the nuance and the situations where your product may not be um, the best and the competition may not be terrible or bad. Um, again, it goes back to coming up with specific use cases um, where your product has a likely very good fit for that, uh, for the user. <clears throat> Number eight, this one. Um, so back up your claims with evidence. Um, and you know we've got two types of evidence or two two main categories of evidence. You know we've got quantitative evidence, which is things like statistics or any other research. It's things like case studies with quantifiable outcomes. Um, but what can also be valuable is qualitative evidence and um, things like expert claims or testimonials, even anecdotal stories or examples um, are great pieces of evidence. Um, and you know other things like case studies uh, with more qualitative outcomes rather than um, quantitative ones. And um, and I think even to some degree, uh, referencing your technical documentation um, can be really great evidence um, in, in some circumstances. And what you want to think about when you're choosing what kind of evidence to provide, um, things that indicate quality or, um, you know, if you can answer, is it valid, is it relevant, and is it unique, like within the article. Um, and you know, ask yourself, does the evidence directly connect with a cause and effect relationship to the claim that you're trying to make? Um, and it's absolutely okay um, to make claims um, without evidence um, when we're, especially when we're quoting somebody else. So for example, um, it's absolutely okay to say, by working together, we make something greater than the sum of its parts. So that's more of a, an emotional claim, which is, which is um, also acceptable. <clears throat> Number nine, um, speak from or reference an authoritative voice. Um, this, uh, I think that a lot of people do this really well already, um, especially in the Drupal community. Um, if you're writing a blog post, um, quoting or interviewing 
or referencing um, another expert in the community um, helps build a lot of trust around a particular topic. <clears throat> and um, number 10. So recognizing and acknowledging others, um, they're recognizing their expertise and their knowledge, recognizing their contributions, and recognizing the competitive offerings um, can also uh, help build a lot of trust. Um, and this point was uh, also goes back to one of the original conversations that I had with Jam about authentic communication and um, you know, making sure that you're being very intentional about um, recognizing and acknowledging um, the expertise and the work of, of others. Um, so that was point number 10. And um, all that being said, I would like to make the argument um, that if we take all of these types of actions, these and more, um, that we'll be able to have built um, more trust and more trust equals more connection, and that will be better for our businesses and better for our communities overall. Um, I have uh, all of these beautiful pictures that I found, I found on Unsplash, and so I can share um, all of the, the links here at the end of the presentation. See, and that's building trust, giving credit where credit's due, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and that's uh, that's everything. Do we? Hey, so nice, pre nice presentation, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I like the I like the contrast between the mm, sort of mechanical pseudo scientific uh, stuff that I showed this morning and the the art and the um, what goes into then turning that into words that are the most effective, right? The sort of the, all of that goes into then choosing how we say the things that we've determined to be relevant and important, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to hear, I don't know if it's a, a great format for this, but I'd love to hear um, any input, examples, feedback, or even just to pose the question, you know, is this something that you're already, that you think about, um, either when you're creating your own materials or when you're consuming uh, materials from other companies? Um, I'd love to put that out into the room, if it's, if the format works. Tim, you wanted to put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Finn, I have a question for you. You, you operate in, within a collective and um, work for a lot of public bodies and um, people and organizations who want to make the world a better place. Does this resonate with you? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, it resonates with, with everything. I found it particularly interesting to think about... Can you hear him? Oh. No. Okay, hold on, sorry. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot, That's Finn. That's okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me yeah. now? Okay, good. Um, no, I think it, it does definitely resonates. Um, I found it particularly interesting looking at the, the different domains, thinking through the domains of, of, of your communications and where trust comes in. Obviously, you mentioned support and um, and training and then going into the into the kind of a product communications or editorial, you know, but thinking at every level, how is what I'm communicating actually portraying the trust, you know, that I need to build and am I being absolutely, you know, true, correct and I think I'm going to go back over your slides if you'll share them and just think about those 10, 10 things and take it back to the rest of my team and indeed people that we work with because I, yeah, I think that's, cool. that's crucial. And I love the idea of sharing what we do, you know, we're open source by nature and open yeah. and sharing and sharing better ways to do things, better ways to communicate, builds us as a community, builds us as individuals and helps our clients and yeah, I think that's great. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Finn. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Anyone else? It's the end of a long day here. Everyone needs a beer. <laughs> I don't need it. Yeah. Enjoy your beer. Okay. <laughs> I won't stand in the way between you and beer. So, um, totally happy to share those slides with you, Finn. Um, I have them on my machine, so are you here this weekend as well? Yeah. I'm just going to shoot out a PDF out of the two presentations from today, and then anybody who wants them, I'm totally happy to send them. 
And um, Tracy, thank you so much. That was really, really awesome that you put that together, and it really captures some things that we haven't talked about in public before. So thanks, thanks for putting in that effort. It was definitely worth it.